Hello and welcome to the Michael Ask Book Week, a part of our 125 celebrations. You are joining us today on a literary tour of our campus, guided by seminal scenes from the blockbuster South African novel Spud. Old boy and author John van der Reid's four book Spud series was a runaway success in South Africa, smashing all local fiction sales records, selling over 650,000 copies globally, and earning the author four short listings for the Nielsen Sapnet Gold Book Award, winning it twice in 2006 and again in 2010. All four books, which have been adapted into highly successful full-length movies screened around the world, are loosely based on John's own coming-of-age experiences at Michaelos during an era of radical social and political recalibration in the early mid-1990s. An interesting time for a young South African to be growing and learning at a multiracial school. So much has changed at Michaelos since Van der Reid's days here, but his colorful characters and their school day adventures are every bit as recognizable today as they would be to anyone who has ever experienced the fun of boarding school life. An African guard salutes us and then opens the huge white school gates. We pass through the drive along a beautiful avenue of trees called Pilgrim's Walk towards the school's gigantic red brick buildings, which are all covered in green moss and ivy. My father is so busy pointing out a pair of mating dogs to my mother that he doesn't spot the speed hump that savages the underbelly of the car. Our station wagon limps up to the school and slides in between a Rolls Royce and a Mercedes Benz. To announce its grand arrival, our rust infested jalopy vomits up a couple of gallons of oil onto the ancient cobblestone paving. 6 p.m. The dining hall. I gathered my tray and joined the queue for roast pork, mashed potatoes and vegetables. Around me came the murmuring of boys, a few giggles, a swallowed comment. This wasn't going to be easy. I received my dinner and stepped out into the open dining hall and was met with a wall of sound. 300 odd boys were bleating at me like deranged sheep. Linton Austin, the prefect on duty, leapt to his feet and thumped the gavel into the table. After he had threatened to have our condiments removed, the chaos settled into whispered jibes and hideous sniggers. The rest of the crazy eight were beside themselves with glee. Simon ordered me not to look so sheepish, which predictably had Rambo on the floor in hysterics. The bad news is that I have to look like a sheep for nearly four weeks, beginning to wonder if it's worth it. After lights out, Bogo accused Fatty of being a chicken because he refused to eat a tin of shoe polish. Bogo then did a loud chicken rooster impersonation. Rambo joined in with a very realistic cow moo. I threw in a high-pitched sheep bar for good measure. Then followed the rest. Gecko barked like an old granny's poodle and Fatty shouted like a baboon. Simon tried a hippo, but ended up sounding exactly like Viking. The farmyard musical dissolved into fits of cackling laughter, hyenas, and then into general Friday night chaos. Just as well, Rain Man had already gapped it for his hideaway because the noise would have spooked the hell out of Roger. Suddenly, from across the quadrangle, came a savage blast of animal noises. Barnes House first and second years replied with interest. Not to be outdone, the seven of us redoubled our efforts raising new farmyards from all over the school. Soon, Finn, Century, West, King and Woodall houses joined in with gusto. Suddenly, the school was alive with the sound of domestic and other animals in a splendid display of late-night school spirit. Then, some idiots set off the siren. There's always one goon who takes things too far. Unfortunately, that idiot, standing in the middle of the quad in his dressing gown with the lantern, looked astonishingly like the Glock. We leapt away from the windows and dived into our beds. 1.15 a.m. All awake and ready for the night swim. Poor Gecko has been forced to take part despite some desperate whimpering and sniveling. Rambo insisted that, in a low, menacing voice, there can be no witnesses. Rambo led us through the dormitory window and onto the vestry roof. I dared not look down at the quadrangle 20 feet below and shuffled along the precipice holding onto the elastic of Bogo's underpants. The roof creaked loudly as Fatty, bringing up the rear, landed on the old tin roof. Simon held the terrified gecko with one arm as our intrepid group skulked along the roof to the chapel window. After some squeezing, pushing and prodding, we forced Fatty through the window and into the gallery of the chapel. With a solitary candle burning, the chapel was wickedly freaky. I could hear my heart thumping and Fatty's heavy breathing behind me. Rambo led us down the stairs and along the aisle of the chapel. As we crept past the 134-year-old altar, 
Rambo jumped into the pulpit, spread his arms out like the Pope and said, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to hell. It was only after about half an hour of wild storytelling that we realized that we were short by one member. Fatty was missing. Rambo reckoned he had been caught by the guards. Simon said he was probably hiding somewhere. We tried to remember where we last saw him. I remember trying to dunk him in the dam, but after that... Mad Dog offered to go and find him, but once again Rambo insisted that we all go. Poor Gecko's eyes nearly popped out at the thought of having to repeat the process. For the second time we scrambled out of the window and onto the now slippery tin roof, and there we stopped. Our mission was complete. Well, nearly. Vern's torch lit up a gigantic backside half covered by shredded blue underpants sticking out of the chapel window. Fatty had got stuck coming back through the window. Not sure why he was reversing through the window in the first place. After some hushed cackling and a few cruel comments, we set about trying to free Fatty. After the seven of us pulled his legs, excuse the pun, for some time, Mad Dog decided that the only way to free Fatty was to push him forward, back into the chapel. Work that one out. Unfortunately, the big guy just wouldn't budge. With every push and prod, Fatty groaned in pain, and to make matters worse, it began to pour with rain. 1.30. The Gov and his wife must have just had a savage fight. As I arrived at his house, her car sped down the driveway and then screeched down the road. Inside, the Gov was picking up the last few pieces of the broken plates. An empty bottle of wine lay smashed on the kitchen floor, and a freshly opened bottle of red lay waiting on the table. I offered to help and then to leave, but the Gov insisted that I stay. We sat down and began a bizarre conversation about Enid Blyton. I finished Famous Five, but had to read it in secrecy. It wouldn't do for the major scholarship winner to be caught reading Enid Blyton. Never mind the fact that it nearly crept into the Milton Top Ten. The Gov drank heavily and continued to sing Enid Blyton's praises until he admitted to having a bizarre attraction to the old bat. He then became totally morbid, predicting the end of his marriage, his third. He looked at me with his bulging bloodshot eyes and said, Milton, if I can offer you one piece of advice in your dealings with the unfairer sex, honesty, 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 honesty. Avoid it at all costs. Lie through your teeth at every turn and you'll get away with it. When you finally get caught out, pretend you're mad and develop a drinking problem. 5 p.m. The entire school gathered on the stands at the far side of Trafalgar, the first team rugby field. The first team rugby guards with their coach, Mr. Hall, ran through some complicated drills while Latuli, who's been appointed war crime master, stood in front of us with a red flag. The afternoon was dark, damp and misty. The surrounding hills had been swallowed up by the heavy greyness and only a faint twinkle of light could be seen from the school buildings up on the hill. The whistle blasted shrilly and the first team put on their tracksuits and sauntered over to the assembled school. They stood heroically in front of us, wrapped their arms around each other's shoulders and shouted something in unison. Suddenly the flag swung down and the entire school chanted back in response. A great wall of sound shot around the field and then... Silence. And then the echo, even louder than our chant, rippled around the valley like a gunshot. The school erupted with cheers and shouts. Gentlemen, who are we? demanded Rob Gilson. The rugby captain, six feet four inches of pure muscle, stood proudly before us. The school all shouted back at him. A second year lost his footing and fell off the stand. His mates jeered until Gilson silenced them with a threatening glare. The school cranked up the volume again. Now the echo sounded like a fighter jet scorching through the valley. Adrenaline was pumping through my veins. I felt like smashing something. My teeth were clenched. My hands gripped over Mad Dog's shoulder on the left and Vern's on the right. Spud Milton was ready to kill. Wednesday, 9 February, 11 a.m. Crammed into the common room to watch the release of Nelson Mandela. The huge crowd outside Victor Fester Prison in Cape Town screamed as an old man with a gentle face and a huge smile walked free, holding the hand of his wife, Winnie. Dad says Winnie is worse than Satan. I felt all choked up with emotion. I couldn't believe that this smiling old man was really a communist terrorist. Around me, the white boys just stared blankly at the screen. Floods of tears were rolling down Latuli's face. 3 p.m. During a learning break for exams, Gecko and I took a stroll across the fields, past the dam and up into the hills. We reached the top of a steep hill and sat on a flat, smooth rock that was warm from the sun. Below us lay the school, 
all red brick turrets and spires like a medieval castle. Shielding the building stood the bare trees and underneath them the dry frost-bitten fields. In summer it makes a perfect postcard, in winter it seems a dry and desolate place. After a long pause, Gecko asked me to sing for him. I felt embarrassed and said that I was not allowed to sing for a while. He seemed disappointed and I felt guilty again. He said my singing at Crispo's funeral gave him goosebumps and that he hoped that I would sing at his funeral one day, provided I didn't die before he did. I gave him my word and gradually felt the terrible weight of guilt ease away. The night was thick and still and humid. Away to the west there was the distant sound of great booming thunder over the Drakensberg mountains, which only made the whole thing even more terrifying. After a whispered countdown we sprinted as one across the rugby field, the most dangerous part of the expedition, and into the bushes near the bog stream, which is the stream that encircles the grounds. We then climbed through a barbed wire fence and suddenly the dam was directly in front of us, dead calm and beautiful in the moonlight. One by one we slid into the cool water, apart from Gecko who couldn't wet his plaster cast, feeling the soft mud squelch between our toes. We swam in complete silence until Mad Dog and Rambo tried to dunk each other. This soon turned into a mad dunking fight with everybody trying to dunk the next person. I managed to half dunk Simon, who retaliated by holding me under the water for about three minutes. Suddenly Bogo hissed us to silence. Across the far side of the dam a torchlight flickered across the path, and then another, and another. We all stood stock still in the water, a cold fear creeping over us. Silence. There was a clap of thunder and the wind began to gust with an eerie whistling moan. And then the dogs began to bark. 3 p.m. Even more terror shot through me as I discovered a long line of boys waiting to audition for the school play. After an hour of waiting, I at last had my chance. I entered a small room and there stood Eve, a savage-looking master called Mr. Richardson, nicknamed Viking, and Miss Roberts, who sat at the piano. Eve greeted me with a warm smile. On her lap lay a half-bald Roger who stared vacantly at the ceiling. Viking said, Right, Mr. Milton, let's see what you can do. He then asked me to sing a song called I'll Do Anything, which I vaguely knew from primary school. I suddenly felt terrified, and my voice came out all weak and shaky, like it was coming from somewhere other than my own mouth. After a few lines, Viking stood up and shouted, Thank you, next! With that, any hopes for a career as an actor were obliterated. The next minute, I was outside and walking slowly back through the grey drizzle to the house. I felt crushed. My first and only audition had been a complete disaster. I moped into the common room, sank into a chair, and tried to watch the soap operas. 8 a.m. Glockenspiel marched into assembly, looking as angry as ever. He told us that Emberton and Stott were back at school as further evidence had come to light. He said that the case against the banana vandal was not closed and warned us all that silly behavior would have serious consequences. Then his tone changed rather abruptly and his voice became soft and friendly as he announced Mr. Crispo's decision to retire after 53 years of service to the school. The boys stood to applaud the history teacher and tears poured down the old man's face. Crispo stood up to speak and soon had everyone chuckling when he thanked the school for the pleasure of teaching them, their fathers and their grandfathers, but then said that it had become obvious that his failing hearing was preventing him from staying on. He spoke about what a beautiful place the school was became all choked up with emotion, and stopped, smiled, and saluted. The school roared their approval, and the old man sat down and wiped his eyes with a blue handkerchief. He never uses a white one, because it means surrender.